All right, good afternoon, everybody. How's everyone today? Good, excellent. I want to say welcome. Thank you all so much for joining us here today for our monthly guest speaker series. My name is Peter Hartz. I am the Senior Manager of Career Services here at GIA. As you know, at GIA, we want to bring you the highest level of educational offerings to help enhance your professional and educational development. And one such way we do that is by offering these monthly guest speaker series with experts, experts to share in their area of expertise in the hopes that they can again enhance your personal and professional experience and development. For today's presentation, our guests will share in their professional opinion how laboratory-grown diamonds may differ beyond the four C's and will present the lessons learned from years of experience working with thousands of laboratory-grown diamonds from more than 100 vendors from 10 different countries. Each of today's presenters hold a bachelor's degree from Stanford University and are the married co-founders of Ada Diamonds. Lindsay serves as the company's COO and Director of Sales, where she focuses on sourcing, vetting, and quality assurance. Jason serves as the company's CEO and is a computer scientist by background. He has previously led team engineering teams in using data analysis and artificial intelligence to improve disaster relief efforts around the world, fight child exploitation, and ensure supply chain transparency. Please help me welcome today our guests, the co-founders of Ada Diamonds, Lindsay Ryan Smith and Jason Payne. Thank you, Peter, for that introduction. And thank you to the GIA faculty, leadership, and students for having us today. We're really excited to be here today to share what we've learned about lab-grown diamonds. Our presentation is going to be structured into three main components. The first is a high-level overview. We're going to touch on the differences between lab-grown and natural diamonds and quality characteristics in both beyond the four Cs. We're then going to go into a deep dive, really explore how and why these quality characteristics present. As part of this, we're going to be sharing a number of images and videos, and we're going to be putting those up on our website at adadiamonds.com slash GIA if you'd like to view them in high resolution. Finally, we're going to open it up to what we hope is a lively question and answer segment. And if you're lucky enough to be here today, um, the diamonds that you will see featured in this presentation, we physically have here. And you're welcome to come up afterward and look at them at our table. We have quite a bit to cover in a short amount of time. Um, so the, for the purposes of time, we're going to be focusing our presentation solely on commercially available colorless and near colorless lab diamonds. So we're not able to touch on fancy colors, research and development, or experimental diamonds. In order to ensure that this presentation is available to a wide audience, we've intentionally simplified some fairly complex gemological concepts. You'll hear us use intentionally qualifying language like most, often, as opposed to all or always. Please remember that we're not able to cover every single edge case or every single lab diamond that has ever existed. As part of my job, I personally assess lab diamonds every week for their quality. I've easily inspected over 15,000 lab diamonds above a carat for the purpose of sale. I've seen diamonds from all over the world and have been cataloging and documenting my analysis over the last seven years. The breadth of quality that I've seen makes me uniquely qualified to talk about these quality characteristics. In addition to that hands-on experience, we're also combining uh, information from peer-reviewed academic papers and conversations we've had with leading diamond growers around the world. For simplicity, we're going to be referring to this product as lab-grown diamonds, lab diamonds, lab-created diamonds, or the gender-inclusive man-made diamonds. So, for those of you brand new to lab diamonds, there are two ways to grow diamonds. Uh, chemical vapor deposition, or CVD, grows diamonds from a plasma of hydrocarbon gases in a vacuum chamber, which is known as a reactor. Uh, high pressure, high temperature diamond growth converts graphite into diamonds in massive pressure cookers known as presses. Uh, lab diamonds are not new. The first CBD and HPHT diamond were grown in the 1950s. De Beers has been selling this product for industrial purposes for over 60 years, 
And GIA inspected and graded its very first lab diamond in 1971, grading a 30 point as a JVS1. Uh, but it took 45 years of research and development for the lab diamond technology to mature to the point for widespread consumer adoption. This here is customs data from the US government about imports of synthetic gemstones into the United States. And as you can clearly see, there's an inflection point in about 2016 where the market size for these gemstones grew significantly. Um, today, according to the Knotts Annual Wedding Survey, 36% of US couples chose a laboratory grown diamond for their engagement ring in 2022. For years, the trade has repeated these sentiments, that lab-grown and natural diamonds are identical, indistinguishable without very advanced gemological tools. These are just a few quotes from some multi-billion dollar corporations who happen to sell lab diamonds. Reread that last one. We're gonna put that to the test this afternoon. The decision to use such conclusive and definitive language in describing this to the public stems from a desire to differentiate lab-grown diamonds from diamond simulants, like moissanite or cubic zirconia. But we believe the, the correct way to speak about lab diamonds relative to natural is how GIA has framed it. Lab diamonds are not identical. They are not indistinguishable, but they are essentially the same. And this is not just about semantics. This is an important distinction. There are three key points to make when we talk about the difference between lab-grown and natural. Notably, that there are minute chemical and structural differences between lab-grown and natural. This is how we are able to test for them. Lab diamonds are not able to evade detection. You cannot fool GIA's testing equipment. For example, most of the CBD diamonds created by GIA are harder than natural diamonds, about 30% harder in the crystal structure. Not only are lab diamonds harder than natural diamonds, they're also more pure. Uh, a prototypical one carat lab diamond has about 500 trillion non-carbon atoms trapped in the crystal. Seems like a lot of atoms. But when you look at a natural diamond, you have 1.6 quintillion non-carbon atoms in the average natural diamond. So to put that in perspective for you, if this single Sour Patch Kid represents all of the non-carbon atoms in a one carat lab diamond, these 3,000 Sour Patch Kids represent all of the non-carbon atoms in a one carat natural diamond. <laughs> so as you uh, students working on your GG know, um, there are two types of diamonds. There are type one diamonds where there is nitrogen present that's detectable and type two diamonds where nitrogen cannot be detected. Natural diamonds, less than 2% of natural diamonds classify as type two, whereas the overwhelming majority of laboratory grown diamonds test as type two diamonds. The difference in purity is remarkable. Um, natural diamonds are typically discussed in parts per million levels of defects, whereas Lab-grown diamonds are discussed in parts per billion uh, levels of defects. In other words, the quality of the best lab diamonds is better than the quality of the best natural diamonds. So the second key point is that some diamonds are indistinguishable from natural diamonds with a loop and tweezers. Some laboratory-grown diamonds do require specialized equipment to determine a man-made origin. But our third key point is that some lab diamonds possess obviously enough crystal defects that they can look different from natural diamonds, even without special tools. Lab grown diamonds are rapidly gaining adoption, and yet there remains a pretty significant knowledge gap amongst both retailers and consumers. Most consumers choose a lab diamond thinking it's gonna look like a natural diamond, because that's what they've been told. And for many consumers, that will be the case. However, with the rise of popularity of lab-grown diamonds, we're also seeing the rise of quality characteristics beyond the four C's related to crystal defects. 
So let's compare natural and lab grown diamonds. Well, natural diamonds come from one growth facility uh, deep in the Earth's mantle. Versus there's dozens of growers of lab diamonds around the world. The dominant defect in natural diamonds is aggregated nitrogen uh, that occurs over millions of years. Whereas in lab grown diamonds, there can be numerous types of defects. Some are accidental, some are intentional. Uh, to be considered a natural diamond, a crystal of carbon cannot be altered, treated, or changed in any way. It can only be cut and polished after it's extracted from the earth. The lab diamond industry also is, faces some intellectual property disputes. Um, and these may be actually holding back the industry from being able to produce higher quality material. In covering the differences between lab-grown and natural, you may, help, you may hear us refer to quality characteristics in lab-grown as unnatural. And that's not to say that there aren't similar quality defects in natural diamonds that occur in lab-grown, but the how, the why, and the severity is different. So what should you look for when you're evaluating diamonds beyond the four C's? Well, if you're used to the natural diamond trade, you've probably heard the term BGM. That stands for brown, green, milky. And these are traditionally known as the quality characteristics that you won't find on a grading report. In lab-grown diamonds, we recommend to be on the lookout for, in CBD, something called BGS, brown, gray, strain and striations. And in HPHT diamonds, to be on the lookout for BGP, or blue, gray, and phosphorescence. Many of these uh, crystal defects are intentional, not accidental, and deliberately caused by humans. Um, in our deep dive, we'll go into much more detail on all six of these different characteristics. So how did we get BGS and BGP? Well, in the beginning, um, lab diamond growers really sought to create super high purity crystals that rivaled some of the absolute best natural diamonds in the world. And then in the last few years, interest in lab diamonds exploded. You had a large number of new aspirational growers enter the market, many using disadvantaged technology. A lot of them had no business growing diamonds and they still don't know what they're doing. <laughs> this problem was exacerbated uh, during COVID where you had diamond mining staying shut longer than diamond growing. And you had a lot of diamond cutters that needed rough to cut. So they went to the diamond growers and they said, hey, come on, keep, keep giving us more to cut. And this has incentivized a market that encourages producing as much as possible, as fast as possible, for the lowest cost possible. So what do you do if you need to increase your output to compete and uh, to fill the market and you don't have the capital to do so at an investment level? Well, you take shortcuts. You accelerate your growth cycle, you use and reuse cheap materials, you introduce masking agents that are covering up the fact that you use accelerated growth cycles. Lab diamonds got faster and cheaper to produce, but not better. The technology is not improving. Uh, to be clear, many of these growers are capable of growing higher quality material, but they are actively choosing not to. And this has basically created two completely different lab diamond markets. You've effectively got one that has quite a bit of these BGS and BGP material goods being produced one third the time or for one third the cost. And then you have other lab diamonds being produced more deliberately with slower growth methods at a higher cost. This subsequently spills over into the wholesale pricing market where you can have two lab diamonds of the same four C's being traded at three to five times the cost of another one. So obviously this starts to impact the consumer. All right, what's going on with lab diamond prices? Diamond manufacturing, especially that is operated on relatively low profit margins, they've run into a little bit of a problem, which is that they've seen a bit of a dip in consumer demand, thanks to a recession and higher interest rates. And you combine that with higher operating costs and frankly, maintenance costs to keep your diamond growing operation going. And they've been saddled with quite a bit of BGS and BGP material, notably in the two to three carat range. It's caused a glut of inventory. So this has forced some to liquidate it. 
start selling it for whatever they can get. And this has caused an overall ripple effect through the lab diamond industry. The result is likely going to be industry consolidation. And we believe in the medium term that there will be uh, fewer growers than there are today, not more. So why does this matter? Well, the lab diamond market is rapidly growing and it's not gonna stop. This product's not going anywhere. But consumers and retailers really need to have better information available to them, notably about these characteristics beyond the four C's. You also have a rise in internet buying. Consumers who are purchasing this product completely sight unseen without the assistance of a jeweler, relying purely on grading reports and low resolution videos. This puts the consumer at risk of buying a lab diamond that doesn't necessarily look like a natural diamond. And as a result, the industry could face a bit of a confidence crisis amongst consumers. Here's a woman who posted on Reddit a few days ago. Um, she had just recently purchased a new eye color lab diamond, the one on the bottom. And she's curious, she's asking her friends on Reddit, um, why does it look so gray? Not compared to her natural diamond, but compared to her other lab diamond. Here's somebody who posted on Wedding Bee. It's a forum for people getting married. Um, that They purchased a lab-grown diamond and had a weird faint brown hue. And it didn't sparkle like her natural diamond, so she returned it. And this is just two examples, but this is all over the internet. And if the lab diamond industry doesn't wise up to the fact that consumers are made aware of this and they're frustrated by it, there could be a lack of confidence in lab-grown diamonds as a whole. As part of our deep dive, we're going to be speaking about crystal defects that cause these characteristics beyond the four C's. We use the term defects as that's the correct scientific technology, such as point defects and bulk defects. So whether or not these traits are desirable is not what we're here to talk about today. So if you personally would prefer a pinkish brown diamond and you know what that is, and how that came to be, and what else is available to you, you should buy what you love. We're not here to tell you what you personally prefer. We're here to explain how and why that diamond has that color tinge. So now we're gonna do a deep dive. We're gonna first start with CBD chemical vapor deposition. So the first step of CBD growth is to prepare the seeds. Great care needs to be taken to minimize the number of imperfections in the seeds, such that you get a high quality diamond grown on a high quality, well prepared seed. The seeds are strategically laid out in a reactor. Um, gas is removed from the reactor and hydrocarbon is put into the reactor. And microwave energy breaks apart these hydrocarbon molecules uh, such that atom by atom, the diamond grows vertically in that vacuum chamber. Uh, on the edges of these diamonds, you get what's called polycrystalline diamond material. It's the black rough you see around the diamond. Uh, you simply use a, a diamond cutting laser to remove that material, and then you can prepare that diamond as a cut and polished gemstone. Most CD growers choose to post-growth treat their diamonds. Uh, GIS is about 80% of diamonds they see today are post-growth treated. This is a simple process with which the diamond is placed within an HPHT uh, press. Um, it's a, about a 15 to 30 minute process uh, to pressure cook that diamond to remove some of the voids, defects, and issues within that diamond, resulting in a higher quality, harder, and superior optical diamond. Uh, since 2009, GIA has seen a steady increase in the proportion of CBD diamonds compared to HPHT diamonds, such that about 80% of the lab diamonds submitted to GIA today for uh, lab diamond grading reports are in fact CBD diamonds. So why is CBD outpacing HPHT? First off, it's more efficient than HPHT. So it takes less electricity to grow a CBD diamond than an HPHT diamond. Uh, it's a smaller physical footprint. The CBD reactors are about the size of a regular refrigerator, not a 70 ton device the size of a bus. It produces type 2A diamonds that test as diamonds on diamond testers. 
uh, does not test as moistenite. Um, they're completely inert under, typically under shortwave and longwave fluorescent light. And lastly, it's an observable process. So through a window, you can watch CBD diamonds being grown. If there's an issue, you can stop the process, fix the issue, and restart. So what are the drawbacks and limitations of CBD? Well, it's, it's slow. Um, it requires expensive seeds, typically from third parties. Um, we'll get to that later. <laughs> That's a big one. Um, it's certainly more prone to material issues like strain, blurriness in the crystal. And it's uh, not suitable for melee. Uh, so melee are the small accent diamonds that are used in jewelry. Typically, melee in lab-grown is HPHD grown, and it's almost entirely um, DEF color and high clarity. If you were to pair uh, bright white colorless accent diamonds with a much warmer color tinge, a CBD diamond, sometimes the color difference between those two can be noticeable. So let's get into some color tinge issues in CBD. In this video, every single one of these was a certified G color, but you can see that there's obvious differences in the color tinges. So we're gonna now jump into the first of our BGS letters. That's B is for brown. And brown can be more of a pinkish brown, like the one you see on the left, or it can be more of a grayish brown, like the one you see on the right. And it's worth noting, both of these diamonds came from the same grower. Brown tinge does occur in natural diamonds, um, but the reasons for it are completely different <laughs> and typically at different levels. So in CBD diamonds, the brown is caused by two things. Uh, empty voids within the diamond's lattice and nitrogen atoms trapped within the crystal. Uh, nitrogen can occur in CBD diamonds in two ways. It can be an accident. It can be something that leaks past the seals, like through the gaps of the vacuum reactor. Or it can be something that's intentionally added. So when you add nitrogen to a CBD reactor, you can grow diamonds 200, 300% faster. But the faster you grow a CBD diamond, the more risk there is that something goes wrong. So as the carbon atoms are stacking and stacking and stacking, you can have faults in that. And those faults manifest themselves as what's called a void in the crystal structure. So here's an atomic level look at a void. Uh, what we've done is modeled it and then cut the void in half and then made that cut line in green to make it quite visible. So it's literally an empty spot within the crystal where there are no carbon atoms or other atoms in that crystal. And when light passes through voids and diamonds, you get a, uh, sorry, a brown tinge as a result. Um, going back to nitrogen, uh, nitrogen can also give CBD diamonds a brown hue. Um, even though there's a far lower concentration of nitrogen in a CBD diamond than a natural diamond, you still get a brown hue or tinge because the nitrogen is not aggregating uh, and that's more optically active when it's a single substitution of a nitrogen atom than when it's multiple uh, nitrogen atoms combined together. If that nitrogen atom is next to a vacancy within the crystal structure, you get a slightly different type of brown. So this is called a nitrogen vacancy defect, and you get a pinkish brown rather than a true brown. So going back and forth, if you look at the diamond on the right, this is a sort of true brown from nitrogen defects, whereas it's slightly pinker if there's vacancies associated with that nitrogen. If the color of an as grown CBD is brown, it can be made colorless through post growth treatment, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Um, that treatment effectively can remove the voids from the crystal structure and aggregate those nitrogen atoms. So, if it's a little bit hard to see in this 360 video here, you can see the untreated has a bit of a brownish tinge. Um, but if this is, video is a little too difficult to view on this monitor, um, here's an extreme example um, where you have the before treatment on the left and then you have the after treatment on the right. The second letter of our BGS is G for gray. And gray is the most prevalent color tinge in CBD. It's fairly challenging to spot in 360 videos, so it's also the most concerning. Um, and it has a lot of reasons for why it happens. In this example on my hand, um, both of these pear-shaped diamonds received an F color grade. And the one on the right has a more prominent gray tinge. Here's another example. Um, the diamond on the right uh, has a more prominent gray tinge. Both of these are 
GIA certified F colors. And this can be seen all the way up to, to D color. Um, the diamond on the left has a more prominent gray tinge than the diamond on the right. But to be clear, obviously, the higher we go up in color or the le less present of color, uh, the less obvious color tinges are. So there are a number of reasons that CBD diamonds can be gray. Uh, the first is silicon trapped within the crystal structure. Uh, so silicon is a much larger atom than carbon. And so when silicon gets stuck in the, uh, in the lattice, you have two voids on both sides of the silicon. Um, the source of silicon within CBD diamonds is often the windows, the, the quartz viewports with which you view the reaction. The plasma, the same plasma that's breaking apart the hydrocarbon gases, is ripping silicon off the inside of this window, and that's getting trapped within the diamond. Um, and silicon is very rare within natural diamonds. The second is an overcompensation of boron. As we discussed earlier, you can dope your diamonds with nitrogen and grow them much faster. That gives you brown diamonds. Well, you can then add boron on top of the nitrogen to balance out that and remove the brown. But if you add too much boron, you get grayish diamonds. Uh, this is something that is, Jay was not observing two years ago, but they're now increasingly seeing it in CBD diamonds submitted for grading today. The third is graphitic or graphite nanoclusters within the diamond. Uh, the reaction of growing CBD diamonds is quite a chaotic process. And sometimes those carbon atoms, as they attach to the diamond, they don't actually attach as diamond, but instead as graphite. And so trapped within the uh, massive crystal of diamonds, you can have little tiny microscopic pieces of graphite that then cause a grayish uh, tone to the diamond. Gray, unlike brown, gray gets worse with treatment. So this is a model of a void again, but in this case we have a small piece of graphite that we've represented on the side of the void. So this void gives you a brownish tone. You then post-growth treat this diamond to collapse that void to make that void disappear. But in the process of doing that, the amount of graphite actually increases. So every time you heat a diamond up, you can't get the graphite out of the diamond, or it's very, very difficult to get the graphite out of the diamond. Instead, the graphitic inclusions increase in size as part of the treatment process. So easy to get brown out, extraordinarily difficult to get gray out of a diamond. So gray is the most common color tinge, as I mentioned. Um, and it has multiple reasons, so we'll recap. So if you run your machine too, too aggressively, you can essentially have the plasma melt the quartz viewing window, which creates silicon defects or silicon vacancy defects that leads to gray tinge. You can uh, run your machine with catalysts, such as adding uh, nitrogen and then perhaps compensating boron. Um, and then that certainly can produce a brown tinge and then you end up with the gray tinge from the boron. You can also just grow it too fast in imperfect conditions. As Jason mentioned, you can end up with graphitic nano inclusions. Then during the treatment process, those graphitic inclusions collapse the void and expand, leading to a gray tinge. So the takeaway is that everything you're seeing on the left side are all attempts to grow faster for lower cost. And the things on the right side are the consequences, AKA the gray tinge. So the next topic that we're going to cover in BGS is strain. So strain presents as blurriness in the crystal, uh, almost like streaks of Windex, um, like something you can't fully ever get the diamond clean. Uh, and it's similar to graining in natural diamonds, but more dispersed throughout the crystal structure. Here's a look at a rough CD diamond where the strain may be more visible to you. So uh, without the faceting, you can see that in the layers, you have a scattering of light as the uh, light is hitting those dislocations and areas of strain within uh, the CDG crystal. So strain is not measured as a binary, but rather exists on a scale of good to bad. Uh, there's little to no consensus in the industry as to what is negligible, light, medium, and strong. I just made this up. Um, based on my own opinion. 
And string is not a clarity setting feature. So this doesn't appear in inclusion maps. Uh, it doesn't change clarity grades, but it does change the light performance of a diamond. And these are all BBS1. So crystal strain looks very different in different types of diamonds. Um, here we can see a cross-polar filter for natural, as grown CBD, treated CBD, and as you can see in HPHT, almost no strain. It's characteristic of HPHT. It's another good example of how it is not possible to evade detection or fool testing equipment. So how and why does strain appear in CBD diamond? Well, it starts with uh, the diamond seeds. So there's no such thing as a perfect diamond. There's no such thing as a perfect diamond seed. Uh, every seed, no matter how high of purity, will have thousands of issues, dislocations, or problems within the seed. So here's an x-ray view of a diamond seed. So you can see stacking faults appearing on various edges of the diamond. And when you grow in the CBD reaction on top of the seed, everywhere that there is a defect or a problem in the seed crystal, you'll get bundles of dislocations that rise out of that point, which result in that blurriness uh, that we've just shown. And the seed quality defines the diamond quality. So here are a couple of examples of uh, diamonds for sale on LinkedIn. And the quality of these diamonds is very different, and that's based on the characteristics of the seed. So for example here, this stone here that's relatively clear might build, yield a beautiful colorless diamond, whereas this one here might be a blurry, brownish, unexceptional diamond. So here's another example of how this manifests. So these are x-rays of CBD-grown diamonds that show the difference in the number of faults in the diamond based on the quality of the seed. So on the left here, I have a relatively high quality seed that has one major bundle of dislocations and progressively worse seeds that have more and more dislocations in the crystal as a result. So this is how it manifests, where those same three diamonds I just showed you, this diamond is very opaque, high quality, has high optical transmission, progressively worse to this diamond being something that will be blurry, unexceptional, and an uninteresting gemstone. In addition, seeds deteriorate with use. So every time you use a seed, every time you start and stop your CBD reactor, the quality of the seeds decays. Um, using the laser to cut the grown diamond off the seed can cause issues. And so you recycle these seeds and they get poor quality each time. It's extraordinarily expensive to procure good seeds. And so it's a difficult challenge for the CBD industry. HPHT treatment heals strain, um, simply put. So you see on the left, this is untreated as grown CBD, and on the right is treated CBD. So the strain within diamonds accumulates as the diamond grows until that strain boils over into polycrystalline diamonds. So it's similar to twinning in natural diamonds, but a slightly different phenomenon in CBD diamonds that results in little brown inclusions or crust clusters within the diamond. So here on the left, I have a CBD diamond that has polycrystalline throughout the diamond, whereas on the right, we have an HPHT diamond. These are same, received the same clarity grade of I1. So here's looking at that process through a microscope. So each of these black dots in the center of a diamond here are those poly polycrystalline nodules within the diamond, and they're occurring as the strain increases in the diamond. So if you're growing diamonds, you're looking through that quartz window, and you see those little black granules appear, what do you do? Well, you stop your reactor, you take the diamond out, you polish off the polycrystalline, and you put it back in. And this causes the next part of our BGS, and that's striations. This is the impact of starting and stopping the CBD reactor. Now, to be clear, nearly every CBD diamond has some level of striation ring, some level of starting and stopping. It's not a binary. It's measured on a scale of how many. And not only that, but how closely together these start and stop growth cycles occur. So you can see here on the left, we have a diamond view of a diamond with eight growth, growth cycles. And you can see it's represented by rings, almost like rings on a tree. 
And you can see that some of these are fairly close together, right? meaning that those, those growth cycles didn't, didn't go for very long. Then a nice long gap, and then started and stopped again. And we actually have this diamond here with us today. One of the things that's interesting to note about striations is the way it presents to the naked eye. Um, so you can see on the right here is an example of a stone that we assume has several growth cycles. Um, the best way we can describe it is that it literally looks out of focus um, because of the way that the light is scattered in the stone as it hits these various growth, uh, growth rings. The diamond looks like, well, it's just never going to be in focus. Um, again, this might be a little hard to see on this screen, but the diamond on the bottom is the one that has uh, eight growth cycles. Um, and you can see it's just kind of dead, kind of lackluster, lifeless, um, versus the diamond on the top has a lot more contrast. You can really clearly see into it. It's got a more transparent material. And um, that's really the difference between heavy striations and not. Um, this is another striation case study uh, that we did. It's a little hard to see, but um, if you were to look at the image here in the center, there's literally visible growth rings that you can see. They're gray. And uh, they're visible under 10x magnification. Here it is in the diamond view. You can see the more obvious growth rings along here. And what's interesting about this is that, as far as we know, uh, striation rings do not contribute to clarity grade. So how do those rings form? Why is it that in a diamond view we see discreetly different colors at those junctures? The answer is that the conditions when you start a CBD reactor are very different than the conditions when it's running at steady state, everything's working correctly. So here's a photoluminescence to look at a table of a diamond where we have two start-stop striations. We've got one here and one here. And they found that the concentration of silicon in the diamond was radically different after the diamond was restarted. So this dark blue area, things are running well, plasma as well. You restart it, you have significant inclusion intake of silicon in the diamond, which then decays back to a high quality diamond. As we discussed earlier, silicon can make diamonds gray. So this diamond here will have gray performance when looking at it table up. So here's another case study diamond we have. It had a pinkish gray tinge in person that we were really curious about. Um, and we sent it to GI researchers to get their thoughts on it. In spectral analysis, it showed unusually high silicon and silicon vacancy defects to the point where uh, we concluded that this level of silicon was likely not from etching off of a viewing window, but was likely due to doping, uh, likely due to silicon being intentionally added into a reactor. You'll also notice the very clear, distinct growth line there, and then the way that the diamond looks on the left and right, indicating there's completely different growth sectors within this CBD diamond. And really what we conclude likely happened here is that this diamond started in one reactor, was then removed and put into a different generation reactor possibly one that was being used for research and development purposes. And that is the culprit or the cause of the amount of silicon concentration. It has a very uniquely ugly gray color, and it's really cool. So if you want to see it, <laughs> we have it here. So 80% of diamonds, CBD diamonds inspected by GIA have post-growth treatment. Why? Proper HPHD treatment improves the quality of a CBD diamond. We think that the resistance to post-growth treatment is probably a hangover effect from the natural diamond market, where introducing a man-made concept like treatment onto a natural diamond and not disclosing it is problematic. But we contend that in lab-grown, it's a man-made process throughout the beginning to the end. What one entity says is treatment, another might say oh, that's just diamond growth. Untreated CBD has flaws. It's not as durable. It can have crystal material issues, can have brown. But not all treated CBD is good, and not all treated CBD is bad. So now we're going to transition to high pressure, high temperature, which is a slightly simpler uh, explanation. Right. So how are HPHT diamonds grown? Uh, we're pressure cooking graphite into diamond. Uh, the growth cell is filled with small diamond seeds at the bottom of the cell. Catalytic metal material is put in. Then the graphite, this donor source of carbon, uh, and then a gasket is applied on top of that. 
This growth cell is then put at the center of a hydraulic press where you have six different anvils coming in on six sides of a cube, which is why it's called a cubic press. And that growth cell is pressurized to about a million PSI and about 1500 degrees Celsius. Uh, I can't show you what's happening within the growth cell because you can't put a camera in something that high of pressure, um, but that graphite is heated to the point where it melts, turns into liquid carbon, and a convection is created where that liquid carbon is convected by the diamond seeds, and atom by atom, uh, diamonds grow out of those seeds. So after the growth uh, cycle, the uh, animals are removed. Uh, this growth cycle, uh, excuse me, this uh, is broken open, and we will see that the uh, diamonds are grown on top of the seeds in a cubo-octahedral shape. So here we have the seeds with which the diamonds are grown. This is upside down, so you have the seeds on top, and the cubo-octahedral uh, crystals are then grown on top of that. So HPHD's got a lot going for it. Um, it's got low to zero crystal strain, which results in a really transparent, bright white material. And it's very well suited for melee, those accent diamonds and fashion jewelry. Uh, so what are the cons of HPHD? Uh, it takes a specialized facility. Each one of those uh, reactors, or excuse me, each one of those presses is about 70 tons. So the thickness of the concrete to just have those machines is substantial. Uh, you have less control over the process because you're not able to observe the process given the conditions of diamond growth. And it's less efficient than CBD growth. You can't grow as many diamonds at the same time. HPHC is certainly prone to some unique colors. Um, and we do have these diamonds here today. We're going to just go ahead and dive right in on BGP. So the first is B, which stands for blue. Blue tinge in HPHC is very, very common. It is due to trace boron that is added during the growth process to compensate for present nitrogen. Um, measurable levels of boron is known as type 2B, and about 75% of HPHG diamonds that GIA sees are considered type 2B. Um, type 2B diamonds are more likely to have a blue tinge, but they may not necessarily have a blue tinge, and we have an example of that later. And while there certainly exists blue tinge natural diamonds out there, type 2B natural diamonds, they're exceptionally rare. They make up 0.1% of the gemstone market, um, and they fetch much higher prices per carat than blue tinge laboratory grown diamonds. So when we talk about um, laboratory grown diamonds with boron defects having a blue tinge, um, that does not mean that you might personally like or dislike a blue tinge, but it is considered a crystal defect. So why does the blue happen? Uh, well, nitrogen is all around us, and it is impossible to get nitrogen out of an HPHT growth cell. So it's packed in between the little granules of graphite. It can be a defect within the metal. And so you have to add boron to compensate for that nitrogen. Uh, unfortunately, boron does not uniformly adhere into a diamond crystal. So it actually goes to different areas of the crystal, whereas nitrogen goes uniform throughout the crystal. So you have to overcompensate to ensure that you don't have brown diamonds. And if you overshoot it, you end up with blue diamonds, like this diamond on the bottom. Yep, so both of these on the left-hand side are HPHD grown F color. So here's an atomic model of that compensation. We've discussed that with CBD, so I won't go deeper into that. But I do want to show at the bottom here that we have in the back row, those golden yellow diamonds are what HPHD diamonds look like if you're not trying to keep the boron, sorry, the nitrogen out of the crystal. The white diamonds are ones where that ratio is correct. And the blue diamonds in the foreground is what happens when you have too much boron. As I mentioned, this can be done in different zoning. So here we have different uh, zones within uh, the crystal and different boron concentrations. So some areas of white, some areas of blue. Uh, here's a look that GIA did at an, a large HPHG grower and found very different quantities of boron across their different diamonds. Um, so this is on a spectrum. It's not that some growers produce with boron and some don't. 
uh, it can vary diamond by diamond. So here's another case study um, that we have. This is a greenish tinge pear. And you can see that this is two completely different growth sectors. So you see a, a sort of darker section uh, right here, and that's where you're having nitrogen concentration. And then you've got the lighter section sort of surrounding it, and that's a boron concentration. So literally like from elementary school, when you combine yellowy plus blue, you get green. Um, and that's really what has happened here with this stone. Um, what's interesting to note is this is a type 2B stone, but because of the nitrogen concentration being in a separate growth sector, it turned green. Um, and to be clear, this is not green enough to be a fancy color diamond. This just looks a little off. This actually received an I color grade. So the second of our BGP um, is G is for gray. And gray in HPHT has many causes to it. Um, it could simply be that what you're seeing is a blue tinge. It just might look a little gray to you in certain lights or in certain environments. Gray could be from irradiation, um, and it could become from other elements such as added aluminum, titanium, other trace metals, metallic inclusions. The exact formulas that keep nitrogen out of an HPHT press, those are very <laughs> tightly guarded trade secrets. <laughs> so the reason that we don't necessarily know why a diamond might have a gray tinge is frankly by design. This is a case study of a gray tinge stone that we sent to GI researchers for their analysis. Um, really, really interesting one. Uh, we were all effectively stumped. I think that the, all that we could really come up with from looking at the stone under diamond view is that uh, you might be able to see that there are these streaks uh, in the crystal, almost look like claw marks, and they're fairly uniform. Uh, so the thought process here is that this diamond likely has growth tubes, and that's what giving it this gray tinge. It's honestly one of the ugliest diamonds I've ever seen. It's so cool, and we have it if you want to see it afterwards. Mm -hmm. And finally, um, the P of BGP is for phosphorescence. Phosphorescence is a orange or blue glow seen in a lab diamond after exposure to long wave light, sunlight, or full spectrum light. Uh, phosphorescence is not the same thing as fluorescence. Phosphorescence is due to boron, um, but it's not necessarily only seen in blue tinge. So I'm gonna touch on that a little bit more in a second. Um, phosphorescence can make a diamond look kind of hazy or milky in low light environments. It can last for a few seconds or several minutes. Um, and for today, we're only speaking about phosphorescence under long wave light. We're not talking about short wave light. Short wave light is filtered by our atmosphere. Um, it's a special gemological tool. It's not something you should mess with at home. It's a bit dangerous. So again, we're only focusing on long wave phosphorescence, not short wave phosphorescence. So you see here I have four HPHT diamonds. Um, one on the left is blue, one on the left is yellow, one on the right is blue, one on the right is yellow um, in terms of their tinge. And um, these are about to get some phosphorescence testing. So what I did is I removed them from the paper tray and I moved them to a perforated tray. This is in our office in San Francisco. And what I'm gonna do is expose it to a handheld long wave UV light. You can buy it on Amazon for five bucks. And I'm only gonna show this for about a few seconds. Um, I'm gonna turn off the UV light. And now watch what happens when I turn off the light in the office. So the diamond on the far left, so it had a blue tinge, you can see a fairly strong phosphorescence. Uh, that yellowy diamond on the left um, had what we call moderate phosphorescence. It's a little bit hard to see on this monitor, but um, the phosphorescence is not even throughout the stone, right? Because the boron's not even. Remember, we're thinking about zoning and growth sectors. The same phenomenon happens um, with lab diamonds that uh, have phosphorescence. And if you recall on the right, there was a blue tinge and a yellowy tinge HPHT stone as well. The blue tinge HPHT stone, completely inert, right? So just because it has a blue tinge does not mean it's going to phosphoresce. And as you can see from the yellowy tinge, emerald cut, doesn't necessarily mean that um, it won't phosphoresce. So what I did here is I came back to the room an hour later and I turned off the light and I glowed again. And I thought that was strange. And I realized that this is not prolonged phosphorescence that goes on for hours and hours and hours. I left the light on in the office. Um, that's just a normal office light. That's not a handheld UV light. That's not sunlight. Um, so the phosphorescence was actually activated by just normal fluorescent light bulbs that we had in our office. 
that had just enough full spectrum that it activated the phosphorescence. So you don't need anything special to see phosphorescence, um, just darkness. So what should consumers know about phosphorescence? Well, it's not the same thing as fluorescence. It's an important indicator because fluorescence does appear on grading reports and phosphorescence does not. Uh, it can only be tested for in person. And it, there's no definitive connection to color tinge. So as we said, you can have blue or yellowy tinge HPHT that may or may not phosphoresce. So we've just explored quality characteristics of lab diamonds beyond the four Cs. Before we go into our Q&A, we're just gonna do a quick recap. Um, so the quality characteristics to look for in evaluating a diamond in natural, we talked about BGM, brown, green, milky, and CBD, we've got BGS, brown, gray, strain and striations, and in HPHT, we have blue, gray, and phosphorescence. So some thoughts for the trade. Um, we owe it to the public to have more transparency about lab diamonds. We should cease referring to them as identical that can only be distinguished with very special tools. Um, if you're an independent jeweler who watches this, who only recently started selling lab diamonds, you likely have built your business on reputation and repeat clients. And you owe it to them to get educated about lab diamonds and be able to speak to them, to your customers, about what the quality characteristics are beyond the four C's. And if there are any growers watching this live stream, the public is quickly wising up to these defects, and they will be demanding these goods that lack BGS and BGP. Please improve the quality of your growth and produce better diamonds. And don't lie, because the diamonds speak for themselves. So should GIA cover this material? Should GIA go beyond the four C's? Simply put, no. Uh, there wouldn't be consistency amongst graders or laboratories. Uh, everything that we're showing today is very subjective. There's also a substantial change in fluidity in the quality of diamonds, such that it would be impossible to determine these aspects on a relative scale. And pragmatically speaking, producing color masters on all these different vectors and variables we just laid out is really not possible. And lastly, as the market has shown, there's a desire to simplify the reports, to make them faster and cheaper as someone growing a diamond to purchase, not make them more expensive and more complicated. So on behalf of the Ada Diamonds team, we deeply appreciate the ongoing work of GIA researchers. We want to give a very special thank you to Dr. Louis Wang and Dr. Sally Maganya, who um, not only helped us prepare for this presentation today, but have provided years of education and frankly inspiration for Jason and I um, with all of the coverage of Labro Diamonds. And we also want to give a special thank you to GIA's Communication Director Stephen Morriso for having us here today. Um, so finally a game. Woohoo! <laughs> um, I'm going to show you two diamonds up on the screen. One of them is lab grown and one of them is natural. And I'm going to ask if you think the nat which one is the lab diamond. If you think it's the one on the left, raise your hand, and then I'll say if you think it's the one on the right, raise your hand. We're going to start first with J color, and then we're going to make it a little bit harder after that. To be clear, this is not a beauty contest. I'm not asking you which one do you like or which one do you prefer. I'm asking you which one do you think is lab grown based on what you've learned today. Which of these is the lab diamond? Who here thinks it's the one on the left? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you think it's because I can hear you guys. Okay. Which one, who thinks it's the one on the right? The lab diamond is the one on the left. You can see that it has blue nuance. Which is the lab diamond? Who here thinks it's the one on the left? Who here thinks it's the one on the right? Very good, almost all of you. Brown tinge, right? It's something to note that despite the fact that this CBD diamond has a brown tinge, notice the crystal material is still really clear, right? It still looks really nice because it's still type 2A. Um, which is the lab diamond? Lab <laughs> Very good, wow. <laughs> Very confident. Um, that pinkish tinge is from nitrogen vacancy defects. Very good. Um, which one do you think is the lab diamond? Who here thinks it's one on the left? No. Who here thinks it's one on the right? 
Very good. The one on the left has BGM and has that greenish tinge. All right, we're going to make it a little... So the one on the right is the lab. So the one on the right is the lab grown diamond. Very good. Thank you. Um, we're going to make it a little bit harder. We're now going to go to G color, so less color present. Who here thinks the lab diamond is the one on the left? Who here thinks it's the one on the right? Oh, almost all of you. Very good. Blue nuance. Which is the lab diamond? Who thinks it's the one on the left? left. Who here thinks it's the one on the right? Almost all of you said left. Very good. Um, there's that lovely brown tinge again. This one's a little bit harder. Um, which one is the, the lab grow diamond? Do you think it's the one on the left? Or the one on the right? <laughs> Down the middle, 50-50. Uh, it's the one on the left is the lab-grown diamond. So what you're seeing there is a strain in the crystal as well as a grayish tinge. Um, who th let's see, uh, which one is the lab-grown diamond? Who thinks it's the one on the left? Who thinks it's the one on the right? Yeah, all of you. Very good. So uh, that one on the right, that is the HPHT G color, and that is beautiful crystal material. You notice how bright white that is face up. Um, yeah, that's stunning. <laughs> And finally, which of these is the lab grow diamond? Who thinks it's the one on the left? Who thinks it's the one on the right? right? Almost all of you, very good. And that is pinkish brown from nitrogen vacancy defects. So I don't know about you, but I didn't see any super advanced gemological equipment for that test. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit of magnification. Just excellent training. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for joining us today and for tuning in. Good questions. All right, we'll open it up for questions. We have one here. Oh, howdy. So in the CBD diamond, is table orientation always the same way? Or do they, is it a, the crystals grow kind of cubic. So for fancy shapes, are they kind of adjusting the crystal orientation for tables? They are not. So you're asking, is it is the table grown at the same plane with which the diamond is grown in the reactor? Not always. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it is not. Different growers grow different shapes of CBD diamonds. So some grow very pyramid shaped, where they don't have the option to orient the crystal substantially away from the growth of the diamond, whereas others you do have that flexibility. Some growers also use elongated seeds intentionally for the purpose of being able to better achieve asymmetrical shapes. So right now, background prices like they're like 95, 98 off wrap, right? So where does it stop or it's going to be like, it will be in future, do you see it's like would be completely off the wrap and price on its own? Uh, we, I get asked my, that crystal ball question a decent amount, so I'm used to that one. Um, I think in the short term, you're going to continue to see a lot of liquidation of inventory that's struggling to sell in person. Um, but I do think in the medium to long term, uh, there's going to be enough industry consolidation and enough people getting out of the marketplace that the, the sheer just volume of lab diamonds is going, actually going to decrease. Um, how the industry decides to price the product relative to wrap uh, is certainly being debated widely. Um, I can tell you that there's some sentiment that we they should be moved away, but there's a pretty overwhelming sentiment from the best suppliers we work with to, to stay on some sort of pricing that is connected to quality because genuinely speaking, a, a DVVS1 is much more expensive to produce than an FVS1. Um, and so the, the pricing should reflect that, not necessarily for the purposes of rarity, but for the purposes of how difficult it is to continually reproduce that inventory. So to give you some perspective, if you've got a decent amount of supply in your manufacturer um, and you're selling off some of your best quality goods at the same price of lower quality goods, well, what happens when you run out of the good quality stuff? Um, you're not able to recoup uh, the opportunity cost there. To add on to that, uh, we see wholesalers that sell at wildly different prices. The same you know, FVS may be 2x from the same supplier because there is an awareness within the trade of these quality characteristics beyond the four C's that aren't properly reflected on a Rappaport price sheet. 
And certainly when you get to the point of 92, 94, 96 back, you're, you're, when, you, when you move in those directions on pricing, the actual price of the diamond itself is changing 2x, 3x, 4x, um, pretty substantially, right? So these, these uh, changes are not the same as when diamonds are priced at 40 back. Um, what's worth noting to, to, to echo what Jason was saying is that there are certain quality characteristics, certain levels of quality material that growers are just saying, we're not going to do this. We're sticking with the pricing we have because they know the material is exceptional and that people will pay a premium for it. So there is a market for goods that are being priced at a higher price point than, than some of the, the lower quality goods. Other questions? Well, we have uh, many of the diamonds we showed today. Uh, you have, and we'll have a table over here if you'd like to uh, come and inspect them for yourselves. All right, let's get a round of applause for our speakers here today. Thank you all so much.